Today, we will not be delivering any uh, new material. And I'd just like to use this lecture to revise some important concepts related to uh, edit manufacturing, casting and injection. Some of the things that we'll be covering today or we will be revising today will be important for you mainly for uh, the exam, especially the edit manufacturing and, and the casting. But uh, regarding the polymer processing and the injection molding, uh, the concepts that we will be uh, revising today will also be important for you for the next uh, quiz, because these have not been covered yet um, by any assessment. So, as I've said before, we'll be talking about editing manufacturing, just focusing on uh, really the most important things that you need to know, because I know there was quite a lot of uh, material being covered over the last weeks. So we'll be just focusing on the things that are uh, important for you to know for the exam. The same for the casting processes. And in terms of the polymer and injection molding, we'll be talking about um, the material that you need to be able to know and revise for the uh, quiz number two taking place on the last week of the semester. Okay, so additive manufacturing was the first uh, manufacturing process that we've covered in uh, Manufacturing Engineering 1. And we said that different from uh, subtractive processes in additive manufacturing, we have the possibility of building three-dimensional objects by depositing layers of material one on top of the other until you obtain your three-dimensional parts. And this is very much a biomimetic process because it mimics many of the processes that we have in uh, nature. Um, in general, uh, the flow chart information to build three-dimensional objects using additive manufacturing uh, require that you start with the CAD modeling of your parts. But as we've seen also in one of the lectures, actually in lecture number three, if you don't have a CAD support, you can use reverse engineering, and in particular, you can use laser scanning to uh, obtain the 3D shape of the part that you want then to print. Once you have your CAD model, this is then tessellated into an STL file, this file is then sliced, and then those slices will be physically uh, reproduced using uh, one of the 3D printers that are available for you to build your part. We've uh, classified these processes according to the current standard, the ASTM F42, and what you really need to know are the working principles of these different additive manufacturing processes, namely material extrusion, uh, binder jetting, VAT, photopolymerization, and powder bed fusion. And when I say that you need to know the working principles, it's, for example, in the case of material extrusion um, or fused deposition modeling, you need to know that in the case you are building a three-dimensional part using this technology, you normally need to have, for example, support structures. And these support structures normally have an impact in terms of the overall cost of the batch of parts that you are producing. Also, if you are building something with FDM, and if you want to estimate the cost of your parts or the number or, or the parts that you are building, you need to know that you will not have uh, any cost associated with the recode of your parts. The same doesn't apply, for example, if you are building the same parts, but using a binder jetting uh, system. In this case, <coughs> you need to know that you are building a part uh, using a powder material. And because of that, you will not, you generally do not need to use support structures because the loose powder can actually support any overhangs that you have in your parts. So this means that you don't have a cost associated with the fabrication of support structures to support those overhangs. You do have, however, the cost associated with the recode of your uh, part because you need to be able to dispense or to recode your building platform with uh, more powder on top of the previous layer. 
And in a similar way, you have that same recode system in a stellar lithography or that photopolymerization system. In the case of powder bed fusion, uh, there is an important difference depending on the material that you are using. So if you're using, for example, selective laser sintering to build a part that is made of a plastic material, you don't have to account for the cost of support structures because normally the loose uh, plastic powder will be able to support any overhangs you have in your parts. But if you're doing, or if you're building the same part by using a metal, because of the high shrinkage of uh, the material, you normally need to be able to introduce support structures to fix the parts into the building platform and to prevent any warping of the part due to the volumetric shrinkage when the material cools down uh, to the ambient temperature. So when I say that you need to know these working principles, this is what I mean. You need to understand when you have recodes, what is the process of depositing material? And that is important in order for you to then be able to estimate the costs associated with the production of parts using additive manufacturing. And when we talked about the costs, we said that normally the costs associated with the production of parts can normally be divided into four components. The cost of the machine that you normally allocate to that specific build, plus the cost of operating that machine to build that specific number of parts. And obviously the cost of the materials, both uh, the building materials and the support materials uh, that are used to build those parts. And on top of that, you also need to account for the cost of the technician that will uh, be operating that uh, specific machine. In terms of uh, the operation costs, we said that this can be calculated by um, simply multiplying the, the time required to build those parts by the cost rates of the machine. And we said that you don't need to know how to calculate this cost rate. This is normally uh, given to you. And it's given to you because this is normally a complicated function of um, the machine uh, maintenance costs, uh, the utility costs, uh, the cost, for example, of the factory floor space, and for example, uh, the company overhead, okay? So we know that this is a complicated cost. Um, and because of that, we are giving this to you in case, uh, for example, a question uh, like this appear on uh, the exam. In terms of the costs of uh, the material, um, this is normally quite simple to calculate. And it's basically, you just have to multiply the number of parts that you're building by the volume of uh, the parts multiplied by uh, the cost per units of mass and the density that it's also normally given to you. However, there are a, a few uh, important things that you need to know regarding the cost of uh, material. So in the case that you are using powder-based processes, like uh, for example, binder jetting or uh, powder bed fusion, uh, where in these cases, the build material is not 100% uh, recyclable, the material costs as a complex dependency on the recyclability of the material that you are using, the fraction of the build volume uh, that is made up of the parts versus the loose powder, and the powder or the efficiency that we have in terms of capturing that powder. And for that purpose, to account for uh, that recyclability uh, ability that we have in uh, powder-based uh, processes, we need to introduce the term KR, okay? And this is basically to account for the additional material consumption that uh, we have in these processes. So when we do that, the cost for the material uh, will be KR times the number of parts times the volume times the cost of the material per unit of mass times the density of that material. On top of that, 
if uh, we are using processes that normally require the introduction of support materials uh, in case you have uh, overhangs in your parts, like for example, in fused deposition modeling or uh, sterile lithography, or even powder bed fusion of metals, we also need to account for the cost of that material. And because of that, we need to introduce the term KS, okay? And again, this is why it is important that you know how each additive manufacturing process operates, because if you know that, then you know which terms you need to introduce, for example, in the cost of the material. <coughs> then uh, the labor costs is basically uh, the cost rates um, multiplied by the time that is required for the workers to be able to set up the machine, as you've seen in one of the lectures where Chris have shown you how the machine needs to be uh, set up, all the process parameters, uh, the time to be able to remove the parts from the building platform, to remove, for example, the support structures, either using chemical processes or physical processes, then the cleanup of the machine, the setting up of the machine to be able uh, to build the next batch of parts. The final components of uh, the cost per batch is the purchase price that is allocated to that specific uh, build. So in this case, you have uh, the cost of your machine, and this is basically the amount of money that you've paid to purchase that specific machine. And you multiply that by the time required to build that batch of parts. And we'll talk about the, the time to build uh, in the next slides. And then you just have to simply divide this by 0.95, which basically means that the machine will be operating 95% of the time, uh, 24 hours per day, 365 days per year, and then multiply that by the useful life of the machine. And this can vary depending on the machine, okay? But uh, you don't have to um, assume anything. We'll give it to you, um, the useful life of the machine. But as you already know, the time to build is probably the most important variable when you're calculating the cost of a batch. And the time to build a specific number of parts depends on the time that the machine is scanning the building platform or depositing material, plus the time uh, to recode material onto the building platform in case you have one. And as we've seen before, there are systems that do not require any recode time, like for example, fused deposition modeling. In that case, you should not account for the time to recode when calculating the total build time. Plus the delays that are associated with the process that can be, for example, the cleaning of the FDM nozzle, or could be, for example, the calibration in between depositing different layers of material, or could even be uh, the time that is required for the machine to heat up. Like for example, in powder bed fusion, where we need to heat up the chamber and bring it to a temperature that will allow us to minimize the effects of shrinkage. So all of those times are accounted on uh, uh, the delay time. So in order for us to calculate the total build time, we, uh, as you've seen in some of the tutorials, we need to make some assumptions. And the first one is that we are assuming that the volume of the parts that we are printing in our building platform, they will all have the same volume. I just wanted to um, um, highlight that this is not uh, what happens in reality all the time, okay? You might be building parts that have different shapes, different volumes in the same building platform. But for the sake of these uh, units and for the sake of the calculations, we are assuming that all the parts that we have in the building platform will always have the same volume, okay? And this is normally defined by this bounding box, which is just uh, um, an artificial 
uh, box that we place around our uh, part to assume that the volume is constant and it's, uh, it will not change. <coughs> so starting with the, the recode time, the, the processes that build in uh, material beds like uh, sterile lithography or uh, powder bed fusion or even uh, binder jetting, they all have uh, a recode time, okay? So the time that is necessary to deposit material uh, in between layers. Some other processes, as we've seen, do not have this recode time. So even though the general formula is this, you need to be able to adjust this formula to the specific um, additive manufacturing process that you are uh, given. So the recode time uh, is basically the number of layers of, uh, of your support structure multiplied by the time to recode those support structures, okay? Plus, obviously, the number of layers of the parts multiplied by the time that is required to recode those layers. So the recode applies to both the support structures, but also to uh, the part that you are building. The number of layers of uh, the support structure is calculated by dividing the height of your support structures by the layer thickness of those support structures. And in the case of the number of parts, uh, the number of layers of the part is the bounding box. So the height of the bounding box divided by the uh, layer thickness. And again, the layer thickness of the parts may be different from the layer thickness of your support structure, okay? And this happens also in reality with different additive manufacturing systems. In terms of the scan deposition time, this is normally a function of the total cross-sectional area for each layer, but also the scan or the fill-in strategy that you use. And as you've seen, uh, during crease uh, demonstrations, this can change. So we can change the, the angle, for example, at which we are depositing the, filling, the, the filaments on the building platform. And we normally do that to try to minimize the anisotropy that we have um, in, our, in our parts. But also it depends on the number of layers that you use to build your three-dimensional uh, object. So for the calculation of this time, again, we need to make some uh, assumptions. The first one is we assume this as a two-dimensional uh, problem where we have a two-dimensional layout of our parts or bounding box in the platform. We assume that they all have the same size. And we also assume that uh, we have gaps in between these bounding boxes in both the X and in the Y uh, direction. So if we assume this, then we can calculate the number of parts that we can fit into that building uh, platform. Normally you are given the dimensions of your building platform, both in X and Y uh, directions. You're also given the gaps between the bounding boxes and you're also given the dimensions of the bounding boxes. So if you know that, then the things that you need to do is first to calculate how many parts can fit in the X direction. And to do that, you have to add the gaps in X to the total dimension of the building platform in X direction, and then subtract uh, 20, which is basically 10 millimeters on each side of uh, the platform. <clears throat> and this is just to prevent the addition of the bounding box or the parts to the building platform. And then if you divide this by the dimension of the bounding box in the X direction, plus the gap in the X direction, you obtain the number of parts in this direction. Importantly, and this is a very common mistake, if you're calculating the number of parts that fit in the building platform in the X direction, you need to have, uh, or you need to, to make sure that you round down this number. 
So if, for example, when calculating the number of parts in the X direction, you obtain 20.5 parts, this is just not realistic, okay? You cannot have 20 parts and a half, it's 20 parts. If, even if it's 20.9, you always need to round down to uh, 20 parts, okay? And you need to do this before you perform this multiplication, okay? If you don't do that, you end up with incorrect number of parts uh, on the building platform. Once you have the number of parts, then you can calculate the time or the total time that is required to scan uh, these parts or all the layers of the parts to build a three-dimensional object. And you do that by multiplying the number of parts by the scanning length or the total scanning length and dividing that by the speed, the average speed at which the printhead or the laser will be scanning uh, the parts. And again, this will always be given to you both the scanning length and the scanning speed average, because this depends on the machine that you're using. So even if you're using the same additive manufacturing uh, principle, so uh, uh, sterile lithography, depending on the range of um, you know, sterile lithography machines, some can uh, scan much faster than others. So these values will always be given to you and you will never be asked to calculate uh, either the scanning length or the scanning speed uh, average. Finally, uh, the delayed times, as we've said before, if you know the number of layers of the path, then uh, we need to multiply that by the pre-delay and uh, the post-delay time. Pre-delay times can be related, for example, with the calibration, initial calibration and positioning of uh, the print head. Post delay times can be also uh, related with uh, calibration, can also be related with um, the cleaning of uh, the nozzles, but both pre and post delay are related with the printed process, okay? It doesn't have anything to do with, for example, removing the parts from the building platform or cleaning processes. It's both of them are related with uh, the operation or the 3D printing process in itself. And again, this can vary from system to system. So you'll always be told uh, which uh, times do you need to account uh, depending on uh, the question that you are uh, asked. The second, uh, Manufacturing process that we've covered in manufacturing one was uh, metal casting. And we've covered uh, many, many different things from uh, sand casting to investment casting to die casting, the types of molds uh, and how that affects um, the type of parts and, and, and the properties of the parts that you, that you are casting. But there are some important considerations that you need to know. And two of them are extremely important. One is related with the flow of the molten metal into the cavity of the mold, okay? And we've seen that this is extremely important in order to obtain parts without defects, either external defects or superficial defects or internal defects like porosity, but also the way that the parts will solidify from the melting temperature down to uh, the ambient temperature. And the way that the materials solidify will also affect the properties of your uh, final uh, metal casted part. <coughs> One of the first things that we've uh, discussed is that pure metals uh, cool down or solidify in a very different way when compared to alloys. And in the case of pure metals, uh, and because they have a clearly defined melting point or freezing point, they normally solidify at a constant temperature. And this is very different from the way that alloys will uh, solidify. In the case of alloys, they start to solidify uh, when they reach the liquidous temperature and the process will continue until they reach the TS or the solidus temperature. And because of that, very often you end up with structures 
like these ones that we normally call dendrites, okay? And this normally happens when the material is in a mushy state. This allows for the formation of these dendrites. Importantly, you need to be able to estimate how much time a material will need to solidify. And for that, we normally use the Shvorinov's rule. Uh, and in order to use the Shvorinov's rule, you need to be able to know the volume of uh, the casted parts. And you also need to know or to be able to calculate the total surface area of your parts. Now, it's important that you know that this Shvorinov's rule, it's important not only to calculate the total solidification time of a cassette part, but can also be used to calculate the solidification time of metal or a material within a riser, okay? And depending if you are calculating the solidification uh, time of a part, a cassette part or a riser, uh, the surface area or the total surface area can change. And I'll just give you an example. If we assume, for example, that we are casting uh, a cylinder, if you calculate, if you want to calculate the total solidification time, for the calculation of the total surface area, you will assume that the cylinder will have three areas to exchange heat with uh, the environment or with the walls of the mold. But if you use the same shape as a riser, so if you want to use the cylinder as a riser, in this case, if you want to calculate the total, the total solidification time of the material inside a cylindrical riser, in this case, the total surface area that you have will only be um, two areas. It's only the top and the lateral uh, surface area of your uh, riser, okay? Because the bottom surface area is in contact with the mold and will not exchange heat, okay? So these are simple things that you need to, uh, to know, okay? <clears throat> in terms of the flow of the materials, we've said that this was extremely important to control in investment casting, in, sorry, in metal casting, independently of the process, either was sand casting or investment casting or die casting, the control over the flow allow us to prevent, for example, uh, aspiration, aspiration of gases or aspiration of solid particles into our molten metal that will subsequently give rise to defects like porosity. So in order for us to ensure that we have a good flow uh, of the material into our uh, molds, uh, and to ensure that we will not have defects in our cast parts, we need to be able to design uh, channels and running systems with appropriate uh, geometries. And this is particularly re relevant in the case of the spruce. For us to determine the geometry and dimension of the spruce, we can use both the Bernoulli's theorem and the law of mass or flow continuity. So these sprues are normally tapered and they're normally tapered to prevent the aspiration. And in order for us to calculate or to define the dimensions and geometries of these tapered sprues, we need also to make some assumptions. And one of the first assumptions that we uh, make is that the internal pressure in the sprue should be greater or at least equal to the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure at point one, so in uh, the basin cup, is equal to the pressure at the exit of the sprue and it will be equal to the atmospheric pressure. Also, we are assuming that we have no frictional losses. And if we do those assumptions, we can simplify the Bernoulli theorem, 
and obtain this formula for um, where basically the height at point one will be equal at a height at point two plus the velocity at the exit of the sprue squared divided by 2g. If we want to calculate the velocity at the exit of the sprue, and if we take the exit of the sprue as our reference plane, where the height is equal to zero, then the velocity at the exit is the square root of two times g times the height at point one. If something like this um, appears to you on the exam, you will need to state all of your assumptions and be able to derive uh, the formula of the velocity. It's not enough just to simply write this um, formula of the velocity. You need to start with the full uh, Bernoulli theorem. You need to state your assumptions and make the simplifications that will lead you to this uh, formula to calculate the velocity, okay? Remember that it's not just about velocities. So both of these theorems are important uh, to also, for example, estimate how long it will be required or how long it will take to fill in a mold cavity. So although some of the examples that we've given to you during the lectures and during the tutorials were mostly about calculation of velocities uh, that will allow us to then determine the dimensions of, um, of the sprue using also the law of mass continuity. It's also important to know that there are other uh, parameters that we can calculate or estimate using these uh, two uh, laws, okay? Finally, uh, we've revised uh, some of the material that uh, you have already uh, covered in uh, materials and we've talked about polymers. We focused mainly on thermoplastic uh, uh, materials. And we did that because this is the class of materials that are most commonly used in terms of injection molding. And in terms of injection molding, we uh, talked about the different units that compose the injection molding uh, system. So you've got the injection units where you normally have your injection cylinder the hopper, uh, the screw. We talked about the molds and we talked about uh, the clamping system. But very importantly, you need to know the different stages of the injection cycle that normally starts with the plastification, which is basically dispensing the solid uh, plastic material into the injection cylinder. This cylinder is heated up to a temperature that it's normally below the melting temperature of the material. The screw starts to rotate and the material is homogenized. Once the material is fully melted, then the screw will keep on rotating, but it will have this linear displacement that will force the melted material into uh, the interior of the cavity of the mold. Once it's inside the mold, it will start to solidify and in order to uh, compensate for any volumetric shrinkage that we have, we normally apply an extra pressure that it's called the packing pressure, okay? And this is to ensure that we have enough material inside the cavity of the mold to completely fill in the mold and do not end up with defects in our parts. Once the part is completely solidified, then the material, uh, then the mold is open, the screw will retract to its initial position and the cycle will start again. So it's important that you know, not just uh, the different stages, but also what happened in each one of these stages. And this is important for uh, your quiz number two, because this has not been covered in quiz number one. Similar to what happens in, um, in casting, it's important that we have a very good control over the solidification process of our uh, materials. And in the case of thermoplastics, the effect of crystallinity can be uh, extremely important in terms of um, you know, potential defects that can arise during uh, the solidification. So, 
materials that are highly crystalline, they normally have much higher uh, shrinkage uh, values. And these shrinkage values, um, the higher will be the shrinkage values of your uh, material, the higher will be the tendency to create uh, or to warp, but also to have uh, parts that have uh, different dimensions from the ones that you have uh, designed. So we need to be able to ensure that this volumetric shrinkage of your material is controlled. And by controlling that volumetric shrinkage, we can avoid warping, we can avoid uh, changes in terms of dimensions of your parts. And the best way of doing that is controlling the process parameters of the injection molding process. And an important one is the, <clears throat> the cooling down or the control of the temperature in our mold. And we've seen that there are different ways of controlling the temperature in our mold. The most effective one is by using uh, what is normally called conformal cooling. And conformal cooling makes use of these lines, of these channels that are normally filled in with uh, water or any other liquid that can extract or provide heat to uh, the molds. And the difference to the normal uh, cooling channels that are used in injection molding is that these ones will follow the parts very closely. And this allows us to have a much more effective um, cooling or solidification of your parts. And also much more homogeneous when compared to regular cooling channels. If we have control over the, the, the solidification of uh, the material, if we have control over uh, the different process parameters involved in the injection of plastic parts, we can avoid different types of defects. And we've talked about a few of them. Sink marks, which are normally depressions caused by shrinkage or excessive uh, shrinkage, they normally happen because either you have insufficient polymer in the mold. And in that case, we can increase the packing pressure or we can increase the time that we apply that packing pressure, or we can force the material to travel into the cavity of the mold much faster. The other reason can be the polymer flowing back out of the mold into uh, the barrel. And in this case, we need to increase the pressure that we apply to make sure that the polymer will not flow back. Or because the material is too fluid, we need to make sure that the material viscosity will increase. And the way of doing that is by decreasing uh, the temperature of the mold. So also you might be using a temperature to melt the material that is too high in the injection barrel. In this case, you need to reduce that temperature. Uh, you can also reduce the back pressure, or you can improve your mold temperature controls, okay? Basically, the use of the cooling channels and the temperatures that are used in the fluids that will circulate in those channels. This can, always, uh, can also happen if you eject the parts too soon, okay? So they're not completely solidified, or at least parts of your, or, or regions of your parts are not completely solidified, and they will then cause these depressions. So you might need to leave the part for longer time in the mold. Another very common uh, defect is the incomplete filling of the cavity. So when you don't have the material completely filling in the cavity of the mold, in this case, it's important that the melting temperature is as high as possible, obviously below the degradation temperature of your material to ensure that the material is in a fluid state for longer periods of time, and that will be able to flow into the cavity of the mold and fill in the cavity of the mold completely. You should also ensure that the pressure that you apply, both the injection and the hold pressure are high enough to force the material to reach um, these uh, areas of the mold that are not completely filled in. And this should be done uh, as fast as possible. So your injection speed needs to be as high as possible in order, for example, to avoid any premature freezing or solidification of the material before it completely fills uh, the cavity of the mold. 
And similar to what we've discussed when we talked about design of casting parts, it's important that you try as much as possible. Sometimes it's not possible, as we've seen, but to try as much as possible to uh, design parts with uniform thickness. And this is important because it avoids, for example, the, 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 the shrink marks. Uh, it can also um, avoid, for example, the generation of porosity or voids inside your parts that will reduce the mechanical properties of your injected uh, parts. And all of this is very much related with uh, the solidification of your parts. So if you have parts that have different thicknesses, obviously the solidification rates will happen at different uh, rates. So we need to ensure that they will all happen um, at uh, the same time. And if we ensure that uh, a part will solidify in an homogeneous manner, then we can avoid some of these uh, defects. Okay, so this brings me to uh, the end of today's lecture. <clears throat> I must say that, uh, well, I will now be available for questions, but before, um, before going into the questions and answers, I, I would just like to say that um, it was, um, I know that this was a challenging year 